Oh, 
Welcome to worship, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Today we get to uh, hear from Jesus a parable about his kingdom. And it's a strange parable. It includes some incredible grace and actually some, some violence, too. Uh, one commentary that I listened to on the internet this week compared this to a Quentin Tarantino film. I mean, it's the story that Jesus tells. Uh, it really shocks our senses. Uh, but in the middle of this parable, we get to find our place in an invitation to a wedding feast. It's an end time wedding feast. It's the one we've been invited to and chosen for through holy baptism. And we get to experience our identity in Christ and our preparedness through the generosity and goodness of Jesus. I've got a couple announcements for you and then we'll continue with our service. First of all, I wanted to remind you that we get to come to the church this weekend on Sunday morning for our worship services in the gym. We'll have short communion services in Koinonia Hall. And so those services will be at 8 o'clock, 9.15 and 10.30. So you can come and be a part of that by registering on our church's website, www.stjohnlc.com. That's S-T-J-O-H-N-L-C.com. Also, I wanted to encourage you to send in photos. Uh, you can find a, an email address on our opening or our homepage, and we're encouraging you to send in photos of your saints. Those are the people who have gone before us in Christian faith, into their rest in Christ. They're part of the church victorious, while we're part of the church militant. They're the church at rest. We're the church in the struggle. But if you've got pictures of your loved ones who have gone before you in the Christian faith, would you send those in? We'd love to use those photos as we celebrate All Saints Sunday as the first Sunday in November. So we'll be using those in our service. Send them in. Find the website or find our homepage and the email address uh, to send those photos to us. We'd love to see them and make use of them there. We're going to remember God's gift to us in holy baptism now as we call on his name, inviting him to be our guest in worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the, in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue in our service with our scripture readings, and you're going to help us out with that from home. Someone at home, find a Bible, and you're going to turn first to Isaiah chapter 25, where you're going to read verses 6 through 9. And as you read it, you're going to pause, ask some questions, reflect. If you're on your own at home, this is a great time to ask some questions of God. Tell God what you think of this reading. Tell him what you're learning. See if you don't see a picture of Jesus in this passage. So now's your time to read the passage. Pause and reflect and pray. We turn now to the New Testament book of Philippians, where we'll read in chapter 4, verses 4 through 13. Again, the same thing. Read, reflect, reflect with one another, reflect in prayer before God. Pause, read, and reflect.
come before you, O oh God, and my life has been a poor reflection of gratitude for all you have done in my life. I have used my words hurtfully toward those I love. My thoughts have been ugly, cruel, and covetous. I have been lazy in responding to or completely ignored those needs around me, and I've, I have failed to show love to those who you have placed in my path. In all of this, I deserve condemnation and judgment from you. I deserve death. Yet I appeal to your love and grace, and pitifully I fall before you. But I sincerely repent of my sins, and I seek your mercy and restoration. offers you full restoration. As we have confessed our sins together, we know and trust that he died to pay for those sins, so there's no more payment due from us. Instead, there's only his love, only the love of the Father because of the sacrifice Jesus laid down. And I get to announce God's grace to you. Jesus was quick to respond to your need for a Savior. He came at God's invitation. He rescued your soul. He rescued your life. And on behalf of Jesus, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. to rise to your feet at home as we read from the Gospels. Today, we have the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king 
who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent his other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who has no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's join our voices together with Christians all over the world who are confessing the Christian faith today. And we join them in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's time now for a lesson for our kiddos. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Children's Message today. I want to talk about the second lesson that we read just a few minutes ago in your homes, Philippians 4, and I want to focus on just two of the verses, and those verses I'm going to put up on the screen right now, and we'll read those together. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer, with thanksgiving, let your concerns be made known to God, and the peace of God, which is far greater than all your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety, feeling anxious. You know those words, right? Anxiety, anxious. Those are kind of hard words, but it really just means fear, worry, nervousness. And you've probably felt them. What is it that causes you to feel anxious or have anxiety. When do you feel nervous, fearful, uncertain, worried? Think about that. You probably came up with quite a list. Perhaps it's the first day of school or just being in school online in this weird new world. Or maybe there's conflict at home. Maybe you think your mom or dad are upset with you. Or maybe you've upset them and there's tension between you two. And that causes fear or worry or anxiety or feeling anxious. So, what does Paul say about that when we feel anxious? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer, with thanksgiving, let your anxiety, your fear, your worry be made known to God. And the peace of God, which is far greater than all your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Did you see that word prayer? That, that word prayer is really important in there. When we're anxious, when we're fearful or worried, we're upset, that sometimes causes us to forget to pray. And when we forget to pray, we just kind of circle around that fear and worry and anxiety. So when you feel anxious, you've got to remember to pray. When you feel anxious, pray. That's what that verse is talking about, that first part of the verse. Now let's take a look at the second part of the verse. And the peace of God, which is far greater than all your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look at that, the peace of God. There's another P word. We had prayer, now we have peace. And look at the word guard. Guard your hearts and your minds. Guard is another word for the word keep. Keep and guard are the, kind of the same words. But way back in the olden times, that word keep also meant the strongest part of a castle. Let me remind you what a castle looks like. You know what a castle looks like. There it is on the screen right now. A castle is built around your heart and your mind when you call upon God in prayer. He gives you his peace. And that peace is a castle around your heart and your mind. Can you picture that? A castle built around your heart and your mind when you pray to God about the things that make you worried or upset or afraid or nervous, anxious. That castle gets built right around you. That's a great picture to keep in mind. Pray, you receive God's peace and that peace builds a castle around your heart and your mind. Now, I wanna show you one last thing. This is really, really interesting to me and I hope it will be to you. Think of that word prayer, think of that word peace, they both begin with P. Can you see the letter P in your mind? Yes, the, wor the words prayer and peace begin with the letter P. And I want you to think of anxiety and anxious, that has the letter X in the middle. See it? That X stands for anxiety or being anxious. And when we pray, prayer steps right in front of our anxiety. And God's peace builds a castle around our heart and our mind and builds a castle against anxiety. So we have the letter P over the letter X, the letter P of peace over the letter X. Do you see it? And here it comes. In the Greek language, the letter P and the letter X are the first two letters when you spell the word, wait for it, Christ. X and P are the first two letters in Greek of the word Christ. We sometimes see symbols X and P together and that's a symbol for Christ. Wow! So prayer, peace, they both begin with P, and anxiety, the letter X, prayer and peace step right across X. But when you see P and X together, think of Christ. When you think of the word prayer and peace, think about how powerful those are against anxiety, against our fears and our worries and our nervousness. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for prayer. You have given us prayer to battle our anxiety and our fear and our nervousness. And when we're scared, we can pray. We can pray to you, God. We give you thanks for that. And we ask that you would remind us 
when we're in the midst of those things that make us frightful or nervous or have anxiety, that you would remind us to pray so that we might receive your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you next time. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in? I had one of those opportunities this last week. My son plays a lot of golf tournaments, and I was with him while he was playing this last weekend, and uh, on the second tee box, the player groups all started bunching up. There were actually like three groups of players ready to tee off at the same time on the second tee. And all the parents were standing around talking and complaining about how things were going slow, of course. But then in the middle of all these complaints, a couple dads started a conversation. And I know golf is a country club sport and I do not have the economy for a country club. But as I was listening to the conversation from a couple dads, I realized I was very out of place. They started talking about cars and the kind of cars that they were looking at. And I heard names like Austin Martin and Ferrari. And I realized quickly that the bad brakes on my Nissan were not going to be much of a, a way to continue the conversation. I felt very out of place. You ever felt out of place? I know that uh, when I was in seminary, I felt very out of place as well. When I was in seminary, I was there with some of the brightest minds. It's one of the greatest seminaries in the world, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. I got to study there. But when I was there, I was all the time, I was very aware of the fact that my brain did not quite stack up. I knew that there were much brighter minds in the classroom than mine was. But here I was, having graduated from college in a quick six years, <laughs> accumulating a hefty 2.4 grade point average and somehow made it into this seminary, into this graduate school. I felt out of place the whole time, but somehow the Lord allowed me to get through that. In today's parable, we have a number of invitees who don't seem to fit in. It, Jesus tells this story about a king throwing a wedding banquet for his son, and by the end of the story, everybody's invited. Anyone can get into this party. Anyone. And I mean, Jesus meant anyone. The good, the bad, the rich, the poor, people from the fields, people from the alleys. Pedigree mattered not. Prominence was unimportant, but preparation was. It was essential. The host was open to anyone coming to his banquet, especially after the initial guests put him off. You and I may put off invitations for all sorts of reasons. We may claim to be too tired. We may claim to be too busy. We may claim to be too scheduled out. We might reply back to the invite to, to the to the host. I, I regret to uh, that I can't come. We might reply, I regret that I am coming. But however we respond, there are so many times when we claim that we can't make it. In Eastern ancient cultures, like the Jewish culture was, this would not fly. We wouldn't get away with it for a second. It would be such an offense to the host. It would be intolerable to have an invitation declined. 
This wasn't just, sorry, I can't make it. This was a whole town full of prominent and influential people saying, I hate you. I'd rather be anywhere but with you. I can't stand being near you. I want nothing to do with you, my king. Have you ever thrown a party to which nobody came? Have you ever thrown an event only to have very few people arrive? It's a pretty low feeling to invite people, friends, family, only to find out that you weren't nearly as close as you thought you were. That they didn't want to make time for you. It's a relational slap in the face. Now, George Goebel, he was a comic in the 80s. He was on The Tonight Show one time with uh, Johnny Carson. And as he was on the show, he, he had a spot towards the beginning of the show where he was supposed to come out and have some, uh, some stand-up routine time and conversation on the couch with, with Johnny. But there were other people who were at The Tonight Show that night, and, and George didn't get a lot of time. Uh, Bob Hope showed up, and Dean Martin showed up, and those gentlemen got to go out on stage well before George. But by the end of the evening, George finally got to come out on stage. He was introduced, and, and he got to take the stage with, I mean, the greatest comics of the generation, right? Dean Martin, Bob Hope, Johnny Carson, and here comes George Goebel, and that's when he delivers what I think is one of the greatest lines ever. I'm very glad to be here, and I'm going to tell you, without me, your show tonight would have been nothing. <laughs> this is a pretty fast league. Oh, yeah, this is uh, the eight troops are out here. And tonight. I'm glad you saved me <coughs> now, you know, because, uh, you know, when you come on last, you're... Uh... Did you ever get the feeling... <laughs> Did you ever get the feeling that the world was a tuxedo and you were a pair of brown shoes? <laughs> One of those days, huh? <laughs> and I have a feeling it's going to get worse before it gets worse. <laughs> That's one of the best lines ever. Now, at the end of today's parable, when Jesus teaches, he tells us that by the end of the story, there is a guest who is at the party, in the banquet, at the feast, but he's wearing the wrong clothes. It's a really important feature of this parable. It's where the parable ends. The wedding host, the king, had provided garments for everyone who came. But this one guest appears in his own clothes, not in the robe so generously provided by the king. And remember, how many people came? How many different kinds of people were allowed into this party? There were people from the alleys and the fields, the rich and the poor, the good and the bad. Those servants of the king had gone out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, we recognize that there is a certain fashion faux pas that happens in this story. Obviously, with all of those guests who had come to the banquet, the rich, the poor, the good, the bad, the people from the alleys, the people from the fields, so many were invited, and all of them received a robe when they came into the guest. It was the king's gracious gift. It was like a party favor. But this one guest had a faux pas. Either he rejected the party favor or he didn't receive it when he came in. But he's in that party and obviously he shouldn't be there, or so thinks the king. Now when we read this story, we have a difficulty in this story with the character of the king who symbolizes God in this parable. And this isn't the way we typically perceive our God. Where is the forgiveness? Where is the mercy? Where is the grace? And when we saw the grace inviting all those people from all those places, people who didn't necessarily usually get invitations to wedding banquets like this, especially not the royal ones. I mean, everyone is a Cinderella story. But this one without the wedding garment, 
why is the king so harsh with him? We stop dead in our, in our tracks over what seems like an overreaction from this God character. With such a big reaction, isn't God supposed to be merciful and kind and gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? That's what everybody taught me when I was in Sunday school. What we see in this parable, though, is a king who has two very distinct reactions, diametrically opposed reactions, based on the response of those invited. In the parable, the king is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. He sent his servants to call those who were invited, but they would not come. And then he sent his servants again to call them one more time. Even though he had had this social slap in the face, he sent his servants out one more time. Tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared the dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Now that's patience. That's long-suffering. That's something that resonates. That's the God that we know. This time, though, as he finds this one person without his wedding garment. We can't ignore the fact that the king has a sudden, marked, different reaction. Now we know that the king had sent servants out once more to deliver the invitation, but they killed those servants. They mistreated them. They paid no attention. They went off to their own farms, to other business. And then some of those who were invited killed the king's servants. That's when the king finally gives the invitation to anyone to come. The king's violence in this parable, which is so palpable, it comes only after being evoked. It never begins there. But it is what comes when people think that they are justified, merited in their rejection of the king, this is what we call God's alien work. It's not his proper work. It's not his normal gig. It is, however, his response to sin. And the sin in this case was so severe, God responds severely. So, Jesus teaches the parable against a certain group of people. And I want you to keep in mind the context in which Jesus teaches. He's teaching this parable not against the common people, not against those who are hungering for God's good news, those who are thirsting for righteousness. He is telling these pe- this parable against people who think they've got plenty of righteousness on their own, who don't hunger for God because they've got the God gig figured out all on their own. They really don't think they need God or his servant, his son, when he comes. Instead, they reject him. So this is a parable told against religious leaders in Jerusalem at this particular time. These are the people like the Pharisees and Sadducees, like the chief priests and the teachers of the law. These are the people who are later going to turn Jesus over to foreign Roman soldiers so that Jesus can be executed, crucified. And if you're a character in this parable, it's more likely that you're one of the people who's invited later. One of the people that gets an invitation out of the field, out of the alley. Some good, some bad, some rich, some poor. The warning here is not so much against people like you. It's against people who want to put Jesus on the cross. Now that said, well... We consider that maybe we're not the target of the judgment in the parable. We need to be warned through the parable too. It's not aimed directly at you, but it still communicates to you. While primarily, abruptly, forcefully, it warns the religious leaders of Jesus' day, it can secondarily provide a gentle, subtle, but still grave warning to you and me. And maybe the warning is like this. Don't give up your garment of grace. 
when God gave it to you in your baptism, he robed you in the righteousness of Jesus, in the goodness of God's Son. He wrapped you up in all of his love. Don't take off that garment of grace. Don't remove the skins that God provided in order to put the fig leaves of your own making back on. God has supplied you with the finest cloth, the purest fabric of faith, the material of salvation, robes of righteousness, garbs of goodness. And the great news is, he doesn't dress you in your own stuff. And he doesn't expect you to get into the wedding feast in your own garments. Instead, he dresses you with Christ as your cover. Jesus' goodness is your garment. Through holy baptism, you have washed your robes in the blood of the Lamb, and they are made white. You're ready to go into the feast, to join the great end-time assembly. The table is set. You are an honored guest. Don't give that up for anything. Now, the guest in the parable, who's found to be without his wedding garment who's tied up hand and foot and thrown into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, that is an indication of how angry God can get. Chad Bird points out in a video that this is not God's anger towards the typical person. This is God's anger at someone who decides to try to come by his own righteousness by his own merits, by his own terms, in his own clothes. A pastor named Jeremy Myers blogged about this, and he gave a second approach to interpreting this character without the right wedding garment. He said, this is reminiscent of Jesus' earlier statement, that only thieves and robbers enter a sheepfold by coming over a wall. Everyone else comes in through the front gate. The implication is that this man who was in the feast without the proper clothes was a thief who climbed in over a wall. Most ironically, of course, is that there were likely many thieves in this wedding feast, but they had come in through the door, the front door, and so were given the proper wedding clothes to wear. So a second interpretation of this parable is that the problem is maybe not that somebody came in trying to dress themselves in their own righteousness, but the problem is they came in the wrong way, seeking to do harm to those who were inside. And Jeremy continues, all are invited. And it does not matter who, throws, who shows up first or last, all will be welcomed Those who accept the invitation, however, must recognize that while they will be given blessings and benefits from the overabundance of God's generosity, these blessings and benefits must be gained the right way by entering through the front door, which is Jesus, and must be used in the service of others. Jesus is that door. The scripture tells us next, for many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus calls many. How many received an invitation? But the chosen ones come through Jesus and receive through Christ their wedding garment because we come through the front door. You've been called by the gospel. And you've been chosen by God through his gift of holy baptism. You've been robed in the righteousness of Jesus there. Just as we put a robe around a child, or in our case at our church, we robe that child in a blanket at their baptism, so in your baptism you were robed in the righteousness of your Redeemer, Jesus. Ready! For the wedding banquet, the end time feast, when Jesus the bridegroom is united with his victorious, triumphant bride, the church, at that great eschatological end time nuptial 
the marriage of the Lamb in His kingdom. And we will sit down at the feast because we've been prepared. Because we've come in through the door. We've come in through Christ. We've had our entrance through baptism. And knowing Jesus as our Savior, we're made ready. Because we don't come in our own works, in our own righteousness, expecting God's rewards. We come confident, more confident than we could ever be by our own means. We come confident in the righteousness of Jesus, ready to receive the Father's welcome because of Christ. Well done, good and faithful servants. Join in your master's happiness. Amen. attention to our time of prayer where we get to lift up our voices to the Lord expecting for him to to answer when we knock to to find us when we seek him and so in our prayers today we seek and we knock and we ask for the sake of many people who are undergoing trials and 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 struggles and we also give our thanks to God for the many blessings that he has given our way let us pray together our heavenly father we thank you for the gift of life for your blessings in our time, when so many things can, uh, can turn our attention away from blessings, we recognize today that you have been so, so good to us. You have given us new life through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of your Holy Spirit. In holy baptism, you have raised us up with Jesus into a new life with him, and we give you our praise. You have robed us. You have made us ready for the end-time banquet. Lord, in your mercy... Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling for health, especially Mike and Judy's son, Aaron, and Nanda, and Roger and Barbara's son, Matthew, that you would grant recovery and strength in spirit and body, all according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for Earl Trenda's family, thanking you for the life you granted him here in this place, for the time that he spent with us as a member of St. John Lutheran Church, and as his family has now laid him to rest. Oh, Lord, hear us as we cry out to you for them, that you would comfort them in their grief, that you would make them knowledgeable of your salvation, that you would point, to them, point them to the day of resurrection that is coming where Earl and all the saints in heaven will rise up because Jesus has risen up and your whole church victorious will enjoy the heavenly kingdom that comes to earth and the the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the nation that we live in as it is in a time of inner struggle and conflict. Lord, allow your church to be a light that shines bright in this dark time, that we might be one of those unique communities where grace and unity can be found because we find our unity not in our political alliances, but being allied with our King Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray for all those who are struggling to battle against coronavirus and many other diseases. For all those who work in healthcare, we thank you for those people in those vocations. 
and ask your abundant blessing on all those who are trying to work up a vaccine and that it would be done safely in a way that brings help and not harm to the people of our nation and world. Lord, we ask that you would set us free from the pandemic and from our fears over the virus and that you would uh, allow us to regain that freedom of being out and about and opening economies and schools and stores and restaurants and, and our lives again. That we might return to, to something that is, is a little bit more normal, but Lord, we are really looking forward to the day of Jesus' return where we won't know the normal that we've had because it will be so much better because it will be that wedding feast of the Lamb in his kingdom. Bring that day. Speed Jesus' return. Come soon, Lord Jesus. It is in the name of Christ that we pray all of this, Father, trusting that you'll hear us and act upon our prayers. Amen. Join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. The Lord your God is strong with his mighty arm when you call on his name. He will come and save. He will come and save. He will come and save you. Say to the weary one, your God will surely come. Come and save you. He will come and save.